Welcome to Camp Constitution Radio with your host, Hal Shirtliff. This show is heard on WBCQ The Planet every Monday night at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, broadcast out of Monticello, Maine in Arista County. And our, it is sponsored by Camp Constitution, which, among other things, runs a week-long family camp. And our camp is coming right up less than a month away. July 2nd to the 9th, and uh, we still have room for people uh, interested in attending the camp or even learning more about it, please visit our website, campconstitution.net. And while you're on our website, please check out our YouTube channel. We have uh, over 500 videos, uh, classes, uh, recordings, or videotapes, video recordings of our various classes over the last four or five years and other events throughout the year that we participate in, and um, as well as this radio show. We do host, uh, we do post a lot of our shows on the YouTube. And also subscribe to the channel, visit our Facebook page, Camp Constitution, and like the page. Well, lots of, lots of things have happened. It's been a very busy uh, news week, uh, and we were very busy, Camp Constitution. Last Sunday, we appeared on a radio show in Connecticut, uh, uh, Laura, uh, Laura Hopkins, um, her Liberty show, and it was uh, a very good time. Uh, we're getting, we got an invitation to be on a show tomorrow in Rhode Island, and then next week another show in studio. Uh, we came back from a homeschool show in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. This would be the uh, Christian Homeschools of Pennsylvania's annual annual homeschool show it was uh, this past weekend, and we had a really good time there. Met a lot of people. It was. The busiest homeschool show I've ever been involved in, uh, usually most of the homeschool shows, I should say, the only homeschool shows I've been involved in were those in New England, and uh, this is the first time we kind of spread out, and we were very well received, and we were busy table, lots of people took our information. We also had a chance to do a workshop on the Article 5 issue, which is an important issue. We discussed this, and over the you know, a lot of a lot of our shows are dedicated to that, and then we had some success. Um, we had a good turnout. There were five workshops at the same time, and we had about 35 to 40 people in the attendance, which I think is pretty good because of all the other things going on. And uh, these homeschool shows though are a great place. Uh, I encourage people who who are considering homeschooling just to go online and just put down homeschools in whatever state you're in, there's all kinds of homeschool organizations. Some are Christian-based, some are secular-based. They have black homeschoolers groups. I'm sure there's Jewish homeschooler groups. But it's a great uh, place to learn about the subject, the laws in your particular state. And um, with with our family, we have no no option as far as we're concerned. We've been homeschooling for years. And it's a great place for um, promoting our camp because... The people there, for the most part, are those that are sympathetic with the ideas of liberty, limited government, the U.S. Constitution. Although it is interesting that uh, our, our presence at these homeschool shows, I think, are very important. What we do is we uh, we offer a little 10-question quiz, and people take it and get a free copy of the Constitution. And we had some, some young people and adults who did very well, and we had some that didn't do so well. And the idea of our uh, being there isn't just to get people to our camp, but it's also to reach out with important information. We had information on Common Core and uh, this myth of global warming and other other important topics. And sometimes we do, when you do a workshop, you have to pay a little bit extra to do that, and you never know how many people would come out. But um, the Michael Ferris's group, the Homeschool Legal Defense Association, uh, well, I don't think the group has actually endorsed a an Article 5, but he has been pushing it. And last year, he gave a presentation at this particular um, homeschool show, and we were able to offer another side of the story of the issue. So, again, whether it's in Pennsylvania or Massachusetts or Maine or New Hampshire or California, New York, I understand that the largest homeschool convention takes place in Florida. It happened, I think, two weeks ago. And uh, there's another large homeschool show in uh, Kentucky, Cincinnati, you know, right in that area. So, uh, I mean, we're talking about hundreds of vendors. So it's a very important thing, and uh, it's something, again, that we 
uh, our family, we, we see it as no option. And many of our campers and families are homeschooled, but not exclusively. We have some people either of private, private schools, parochial schools, or even some public schools. So, well, a um, couple of things um, in the news. Well, of course, another bombing, uh, I mean a shooting, another terrorist attack in uh, London. And as I said uh, last week when there was a terrorist attack at the concert where 20-plus young people were killed and many more injured, probably crippled for life, um, this is going to continue to happen until the people in that country, in Great Britain, kind of get their act together and stop this political correct baloney and realize that the leaders who are doing this are doing this on purpose. They want to see the country destroyed. It's not something that they feel guilty. Oh, we were col- we were colonized and we did a lot of terrible things over the years and we have to be we have to assuage our guilt by doing these kinds of things. No. These people who are engaging in this activity are colonizing. They're coming to Great Britain, they're coming to other parts of of Europe and also into the United States, not because they were trying to make life better, life better for them. They want to embrace the culture. They want to learn about the Constitution or learn about Britain's great history. No, they're coming to colonize, and you're in the way. You're in the way. And they see that you have a negative birth rate, and they know the time is on their side. And because uh, I think the big, big solution is, is revival. England was, my goodness, it was the, it was the seed of Christianity for, uh, for centuries. It was a seed of civilization, even though we, uh, we had an issue with them. Uh, they've done a, so much good in the world. They brought med- modern medicine. They brought a form of government, a just form of government. Yes, there were excesses and there were things that, you know, there were crimes that were committed. But bottom line is they, England was a beacon to the world. And we'll look at it now. It's it's an embarrassment, and I'm very glad to see that they had the uh, Brexit. But if you folks don't get on the ball, you're going to be a you're going to be second class citizens, in that in the nation that was one of the greatest nations in the history of the world, and that's going to go for the rest of Western Europe too, and the United States. There'll be more incidences and things of this nature until we get our act together. And it's interesting uh, the death wish mentality how prevalent it is in the West, um, in the United States and Western Europe. But thankfully, there is a lot of pushback, and a lot of people are just realizing the corporate media, how corrupt they are when, they, when they'll, they'll bash and castigate people who oppose this. They'll call you racist or Islamophobes. It's very fascinating how they come up with these words, you know, and that's supposed to end debate. Well, you're an Islamophobe. And we counter with, well, you're a Christophobe or a Biblophobe or, a, you know, you're a heterophobe, you see. So um, it was also the, the, some of these uh, talking heads, some of these so-called media pundits like Bill Maher. It was interesting. Bill, he had a show called Politically Incorrect. Now, I always thought the term politically incorrect would be a, a term, uh, values that conservatives hold that are considered politically incorrect. So he had the show on, and I used to catch it on occasions. I really disliked the man, but he did say something. It was right in the wake of the 2000, September 11, 2001 terrorist attack in New York City. He said, because he, he, he has to, he, he's a big mouth, and he thinks he can say anything and get away with it, and for the most part, he has. But he said uh, something like, launching a drone is cowardly while being on a plane and crashing into a building is heroic. Well, it's br- we're brave, brave. And I, uh, well, launching a drone is not heroic or cowardly. It's you, you know, if you're if you're trained to do that, that should you're doing your duty. It's not cowardly to do it. Uh, it was stupid of him to say that, but he he is right though. These people are so dedicated to a cause that they've been deceived into believing these things. They're willing to die for it, to commit suicide. So uh, there's something. Uh, I would say people of that uh, bravery is one thing and stupidity and foolishness is another, but I certainly wouldn't call people who jump in an airplane knowing they're going to die cowards. Uh, I call them a lot of things, but that's not one of them. But he lost his show because of that, and there is a sensitivity issue too. He opened his big mouth a little too soon. He could have um, just kept his mouth shut. 
But last week, oh, I guess it was yeah, last week, he was uh, with a senator from Nebraska, and uh, he said it was he said he he used the N word. He didn't call somebody a racial slur. He didn't call somebody that word. He just mentioned it. Uh, he's not a he's not a uh, he's a house, not a field blank. And my goodness, um, uh, he's gonna he might be losing his show, which I don't I wouldn't mind so much. Not because so much of that, but he he's on HBO. He drops the f bomb on a regular basis. He takes the Lord's name in vain. He mocks and ridicules Christianity, and that's not an issue. Not even a yawn. Al Sharpton is criticizing his liberal friend Bill Maher for saying the N word, but he never says, "Hey, Bill, I'm a pastor. I'm a I'm a minister of the gospel, and you're you're insulting me. You're you're, you're vilifying what we do, what we stand for." No, he doesn't do that. He says the N word, and they're ready to chop his head off. But he can say the F word. He can take the Lord's name in vain, and he can he can denounce and mock and ridicule Christianity, and he gets a free pass. That that speaks volumes of our of our nation. And of course, HBO is no barometer for uh, for liberty, is it? And then you have what's her name, Katie Griffin. Now I don't know too much about her. Uh, I we stopped watching the New York Times, New York um, what's it called, the um, <clears throat> first night or New Year's Eve celebration uh, when uh, it was about five or six years ago, they had some people uh, proposing marriage and there were two men and proposing marriage to each other. And I thought, nope, uh, that's it. If they're going to even socialize and liberalize something like this, I'm not interested. So we stopped watching it. So I guess she's one of the hosts and she's supposed to be a comedian. I don't find her particularly funny, but she uh, did something that uh, kind of, that, that, I was surprised to get a lot of people upset. She had a, a, a bloody mask of a head of Donald Trump, and she was posed with it and thought that was pretty funny. But I guess not everybody thought it was funny, and she got a lot of controversy. Then she apologizes, but then she turns around and she blames all of her woes on evil, rich white men. Old white men have, have, have really ruined her life, and she been, has been at their mercy and so forth. She is one sick human being if she actually believes that nonsense. The rich white men or the, the old white men probably have made her what she is. Uh, she's definitely not that talented. So um, I can't see that she's, uh, she got it on her own merit. But that is such feminist garbage. You know, uh, she's doing very well for herself. I'm sure she's a millionaires. I'm sure that she has a very large house. I'm sure she travels around the world first class. I don't think she's well, nothing to have her own jet. You know, she has access to the media. And that's a lot of, a lot of women don't have that. A lot of men don't have that. I don't have that. Uh, and I don't blame it on old white, white women that have kept me down or old white men that have kept me down. That's just guilt blame mentality. Um, <clears throat> so I'm glad to see that she's not being too well received. And uh, with Bill Maher and, Again, I'm not. I, I detest. I detest what he stands for. He's, you know, hardcore atheist, uh, always mocking Christianity. Uh, but I think something like this. I, I don't think it justifies taking him off the air. I think what the other things he does justifies taking him off the air. So, um, and I think it's going to continue pretty much on a regular basis um, as Donald Trump. If Donald Trump sticks to his promises. And he did a great thing by getting us out of the Paris Accords. You see, we live in such a constitutional, Ill, constitutionally illiterate society that the very fact that we were even in such a thing, in such an arrangement, is unconstitutional. It's, it's militantly unconstitutional. Obama had no business negotiating any treaty or not a treaty, I'm sorry, but some type of an agreement He's coming back and saying, we're by executive order, and I'm going to have my administration make all these, all these goals that these socialists in, at this accord set. And by the way, it's not about fighting global warming. Uh, it's all about power and control and implementing Agenda 21 or Agenda 2030 or whatever they call it. Um, my, uh, my friend there, Willie Soon, Professor Willie Soon, who will be an instructor at Camp Constitution, sent me uh, the White House talking points, and I don't have them in front of me, 
but we did post them on our Facebook page, and we posted them on our Scribd page. That's Scribd.com, Camp Constitution. And it just mentioned that uh, that you know, the United States is getting out of it. Uh, it's going to be a job killer. Uh, it will have very little impact on the environment anyway. I mean, if all these nations spent billions of dollars implementing all of these stupid regulations and goals, it would have such a negligible impact. It would be totally unnoticed. You said one volcano throws up more more uh, carbon uh, you know, in, in one eruption than man has done in, in a generation. So the idea that this doing all these restrictions is going to somehow uh, save the planet from uh, burning up is nonsense. And it's another fascinating thing is that the, the, the media, these media pundits, they're sort of like, they think everybody believes what they believe. There's lots of folks out there that know that global warming is a fraud, a myth and a hoax. But you'll, you'll see these talking heads, they'll think like Bill Maher, like everybody knows this. And if you don't believe it, you're a moron. The science is settled. There's consensus. Well, the science is not settled. And science isn't consensus to begin with. That's the opposite of science is consensus. That's groupthink. Uh, when was the last time you heard one of these pundits say, oh, well, there's over 30,000 scientists just in the United States, all of them hard scientists, not, not political scientists, but people who have degrees in some type of science. They've signed this um, petition saying there's no evidence of man-made global warming. It was launched by Dr. Arthur Robinson uh, from, I think it's uh, Oregon. He was the heir to uh, Dr. Peter Beckman, who took over his Access to Energy uh, organization. And uh, and these people, and they're all over the United States, so it's not like there's only a few scientists that believe this. No, there's over 30,000. And they've been uh, criticized, well, they're under the employment of big money and big oil. No, just the opposite is true. And incidentally, it was big oil that started the envi- started funding the environmental movement. It was the Rockefeller Foundation and others like that that got the ball rolling. Um, the Rockefeller, I think it was Lawrence Rockefeller, one of the brothers, uh, David was the last of the brothers who died recently. Uh, he was the he was that was his that was his major goal was to advance this agenda. This, uh, this, uh, so here was a man who made his money in oil, made billions in oil, became the head of the, one of the biggest funders of the environmental movement. So don't let anybody trick you, fool you to thinking that these greedy oil men, all they want to do is uh, destroy the environment. It was the big oil that started the environmental movement. And I also want to point out too that we as Christians, we should be good stewards. We have an obligation to be stewards of, of the earth. We don't worship the earth, but we should be good stewards. And with this private property, that's usually the, the case. People don't go around destroying their own property. They don't clear cut their own property and, and they manage it. Uh, like uh, Dr. Michael Kaufman, who has been an instructor at camp, he looks at a forest like you look at a garden. You have to manage it. If you don't manage it, it will become too wild. It will be more susceptible to forest fires. And most of the land in the private sector is managed that way. I met a gentleman that told me they've been logging his property for like four or five generations. And he said, our trees are healthy. You know, we chop down and we replace them, he said, and we're stewards of this property. We're not there to clear cut and then go to the next uh, town or the next next state to do more clear cutting and again that did happen in the past and um but uh, but thankfully that that has not happened and we have a really good track record in our country in fact it was about 100 years ago the united states was about 90 percent deforested and they think wow just look at look at for example mount monadnock in new hampshire you look at mount monadnock a picture 100 years ago you would see uh pretty much very few trees all the way up to the mountain Today, there's plenty of trees, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, one of them is the innovations, technological advancements and innovations that made the use of wood less, um, they didn't use wood for fuel as much, and, and even furniture, and uh, some good farming techniques, so you didn't need as much land to grow the food. And in fact, I tell people that coal 
in oil and natural gas were actually considered green, 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 um, uh, green energy. You say, what? Coal? How can that be green energy? Well, would you rather chop a tree down or get some coal from a from a, a coal mine? Uh, what about natural gas? Natural gas used to be considered a uh, uh, a negative aspect of uh, of oil of drilling for oil. What, what do you do with this stuff? You know, it was, they used to burn it off, get rid of it as quickly as possible. It was almost impossible to transport. But then came the seamless pipe. They were able to transport it cleanly, if safely, efficiently. And today, you know, it's a relatively clean burning uh, fossil fuel. So, um, so these innovations have made this possible. Innovations in the auto industry have made uh, the internal combustion engine very, very, um, very, I should say, much more efficient, burning less fuel. And all this was market-driven for the most part. You know, it makes sense if I can get a car and I can get 35 miles to a gallon as opposed to five miles to a gallon and still run efficiently and, and get me to point A to point B as fast as I need to get there. So <clears throat> the free market is the solution to most, if not all, of uh, these type of economic problems. It's not the heavy hand of federal government or the state government or international government. And so, so, that's what I, so I was delighted to see uh, Donald Trump uh, get us out of this accord. And let me discuss, we got a few minutes left, but the Constitution. Constitution gives the president the right to negotiate, or the power to negotiate treaties with several foreign nations. Uh, treaties have to do with things that nations, travel, uh, trade, things of this nature, uh, even military arrangements, military treaties and agreements. But once he has that treaty, he now has to go to the U.S. Senate, and he has to get two-thirds of the Senate two-thirds of those present, 51 minimum, to agree on that. And when that happens, the treaty becomes, you know, it becomes binding. But a treaty has to be made in pursuance of the Constitution. And Article 6 has to be made in pursuance thereof. So a treaty cannot, under the Constitution, cannot strip away constitutional rights or engage in things that Congress does not have the power or, or the president have the power to get involved in. So, for example, if, a, if there was a treaty to end literacy in the world and the United States signed on to it and it was our obligation to make sure the federal government had to send agents all over the country to make sure everybody was doing look say method of reading and becoming really functionally literate, well, that's an unconstitutional treaty okay, because Congress, the federal government, has no business in that aspect of it. Uh, if there's a arms, if there's a treaty that deals with civilian gun control, that would be dead on its dead on arrival. That would be unconstitutional. This uh, global warming, this Paris Accords, if it was even if it were a treaty, that and the treaty brought restrictions upon the private sector and you, uh, limited your carbon footprint and forced uh, the coal coal mines to close. This would be an unconstitutional treaty. So even if Obama did the constitutional approach and tried to get this as a treaty, it'd still be unconstitutional. And also, when a treaty is ratified, if it, if it requires some kind of money to be implemented, then Congress, the House, has to initiate that to say, okay, in order to implement the, the protocols or the items in this treaty, we have to spend, we have to appropriate billions here and millions there. Uh, and they can say, no, nope, okay, Senate, Senate may assign the treaty, but we're not going to go along with it. And treaties have been nullified or annulled. Um, Jimmy Carter did it unconstitutionally with uh, Taiwan. There was a defense agreement. He just, nope, not going to obey it. Uh, but the minute one party, if one country violates an aspect of that treaty, that treaty is considered null and void. So uh, this is an important thing. We actually did a class on it last year. You can watch our YouTube channel. Uh, Mark Affleck, I think it was called Treaties in the Constitution, that the Constitution, the treaties do not supersede the Constitution if they are not made in pursuance thereof of the Constitution. And uh, there's so much, so many people are just so in, misinformed on that. And why not? Because that's what most, most of the school, most of the law schools teach that, that somehow treaties supersede the Constitution. You know, Thomas Jefferson commented on that. He said something to the effect that if that's the case, if treaties supersede the Constitution, and he said uh, if the president and two-thirds 
of the Senate can do what nobody else can do, we have no constitution. The thought that a president can negotiate a treaty and two-thirds of the Senate can agree on it and it can strip away all of the rights protected by the constitution, then he says we have no constitution. So it's an absurd legal notion that the case, that, that treaties can supersede the constitution and take away the God-given rights that uh, the Constitution is supposed to protect. So the minute you hear that, you know, and you hear a lot of conservative people tripping that line too, because that's all they've heard, you know. So I had an interesting conversation at the homeschool show with one of the lobbyists for a convention of states, um, Ken Quinn. And he, uh, what they've been doing is that they've been, they've been trying to castigate in any organizations that have come out against or Article 5. They're trying to destroy their credibility. So instead of just dealing with the issue itself, they'll say, well, this organization said something 50 years ago on this and that. Or they'll say they're racist or somehow. And, it's, so, and Mark Meckler, who's the founder, played the race card. And the subject of Martin Luther King came up and the, the organization of, called the John Birch Society, which I used to be a field director. And he said, well, you know, the John Birch Society said Martin Luther King, King was a communist. And, and I said, well, no, didn't say that. He said he was a pro-communist. And then he made reference to uh, uh, the society coming out talking about a Soviet Negro Republic like it was all made up. I said, no, that's the true. I said, it doesn't take much to do a little research and discover that that was the plan of the Communist Party of the USA was to uh, have certain states secede from the Union and set up a Soviet Negro Republic. I don't think they actually ex expected to be successful of that, but that's something they promoted for a number of years, and there's plenty of documentation from the Communist Party. And uh, a lot of conservatives have reinvented Martin Luther King and they've looked at him to be some kind of pro-life, devout man of God. Well, I wish that were true. Uh, but the evidence is contrary to that. And that's the sad thing is that a lot of people just don't know this information. And when they hear it, uh, something different, they automatically reject it. Because um, people like Mark Levin and people like um, uh, the gentleman that runs Oath Keep not Oath Keepers, uh, Wall Builders, David Barton, have, uh, have turned Mark Luther King into a hero. And I have to do is look, his record was sealed for 50 years by a federal judge. Why would they seal the record of a wonderful, devout Christian pastor who was doing nothing but good in the world? Why did Martin Luther King get the Margaret Sanger Award? Margaret Sanger, the racist eugenist, why was he the first recipient of that award? Why was Martin Luther King uh, pictured at a Highlander Folk School in Monteagle, Tennessee, back in the late 50s, a communist training facility sitting next to one of the top communists in the United States. Come on, folks. He's not a conservative. Yes, we wish he were. And, you know, his assassination was tragic. But, my goodness, here's the facts. Julia Brown, who was a Communist Party member in Cleveland who left the party, and she said that, that, the party said we must endorse and support Martin Luther King. She says that the party never, ever endorsed anybody that they didn't control. So the facts are out there, but they, re they recreated this, this new person, this new Martin Luther King. And it's almost as if the, the, you can't discuss that. You can't say anything about any, you can't say anything truthful about the man. And, and, it, and these are Christian conservatives that have bought the line. So anyway, we're out of time. I think yeah, we got about a minute left. I want to thank you for listening. And uh, we'll probably have some guests the next few weeks. Um, sometimes it's easy to get guests, sometimes not so easy. So thank you for listening to Camp Constitution Radio with your host, Hal Shirtliff. Heard on WBCQ, The Planet, every Monday night at 7.30 p.m. And until next week, um, God bless.